everybody. Can you raise your hand if there's an empty seat next to you? Because there are several empty, because a lot of people are standing in the back. If you want a seat, come on in. You have plenty of time. Climb over people. I'm going to talk for a while. So the reason I'm going to talk for a while, because in case you didn't read that little poster we made out in the lobby, this um, concert is being recorded as a live CD. Um, several years ago, I Oh, I see a lot of old faces. Oh, this is fun. Um, several years ago, I, got, I was really lucky to get a Ford Foundation grant to commission several Native American composers. And I was asked to be part of a, a pilot program for First Nations Composers Initiative, it was called. It was based out in Minneapolis. And there are many now Native classical composers. And as a result, there are some programs that are mentoring uh, young native classical composers. So it's a relatively new field. Um, and I, I do feel really privileged to play their pieces. So uh, if you did not sign it yet, there is a email list outside. The CD and download project should be out in 2019, depending on which record company <clears throat> ends up taking it. But uh, f make sure you sign that, because then you'll get a free download. And so that being said, you do need to turn off your cell phones. I love when you take pictures of me when I play and you post it everywhere. So what I thought I would do is at the end, I'll give you a whole song. You can do whatever you want. How's that? All right? Uh, maybe I'll even dance like in the middle of it or something. But in the meantime, if you could really seriously turn off your cell phones, because it could ruin the recording. We did block off the front row initially because I thought, oh, the people in the front row, you know, they're going to be so noisy. Right, Stephanie? I know. Stephanie and Brianna are the noisiest people in my class, so. <laughs> so they don't know who I'm talking about, so you don't, have to get, you don't have to blush. But so in the front row, you know, if you have a coughing fit, just cover your mouth and do the best you can. But. All right, so this first piece, I also didn't have um, programs because I thought they would rustle. And uh, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit, be a little informal about each piece. So this first piece is by a Chodot Salagi composer, Ron Warren. Uh, Chota Salagi is one of the Cher Cherokee nations, and he wrote a song called Songs and Dances for the Three Sisters. The Three Sisters are our, <clears throat> in my tradition, which is Mohawk, um, we see the Three Sisters as our, how we grow our gardens, and it's actually a sustainable agricultural practice that a lot of farmers are using today. It's the corns bean, corn, beans, and squash, and that they all actually help replenish the soil uh, so that you can use it for generations to come. So in this piece, uh, because of the recording, in between each movement, rather than getting right into it, I'm going to turn the page and then start the next movement. So that doesn't mean I ended yet. And when I end, let's, I'm going to practice this. I'm going to go, in case you decide you want to clap. I'm going to play the ending, and when I end, it'll be so obvious because I'll like smile and stop like that. <laughs> Unless I did really badly, then I'm going to be like. Um, but in between movements, I'm just going to try to, I'll be slower than usual. So you're getting to know all these musician things that, that we do. And Claire, thank you very much for womaning the door for us. Appreciate that. So this is in uh, six short, short sections. A song, no, five short sections. A song, three dances, and a song.
Hey yo, 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 hey yo
People come in and out. If anybody wants a seat, there's some free ones. Hey guys, if you want a seat, people will raise their hand again. So um, I'm only doing uh, five songs tonight. Each one is extremely different from the next, and I'm going to end with one of my down tempo uh, songs because that's what probably people are most used to me hearing me do. This next one is called Cello Chili by Brent Michael Davids, a Mohegan composer. He is especially known for his huge top hat that has Indian beading all around it and inventing these um, crystal glass flutes that he plays electronically. He also writes a lot for powwow drummers and orchestra. Um, so guys, raise your hand if you have a free seat so people can come through and not feel impolite. You don't have to feel impolite if you want to cut through. He looked like he was feeling. So this piece, I don't know if you could see it, but called Cello Chili. And what he did was he wrote a recipe card <laughs> for me and said, um, let's see, Cello Chili, cooked up for Don Avery. One neck, body or belly, cut into small pieces. One whole scroll, hard rolled. One carved tailpiece with spike attached. That's that, he's calling a spike. Uh, two wiggly ribs, these we call the ribs, dry rubbed. Four pegs grated or two cups powdered frogs. Not sure how they got in there. One medium nut lickety cut and four roasted green chilies peeled and diced. And then he uses in, as part of the recipe some of the quotes from uh, Will Rogers, who was a Cherokee um, movie star cowboy humorist, right, in I guess the 40s. So, um, so, but he does say a couple things that were interesting here. He says, um, it's a fictitious recipe for a distinctly American stew made of green chilies and pieces of a cello. But the text is also part of the American Indian experience with two, two quotes from the famed Cherokee humorist, Will Rogers. Oh, he was 1879 to 1935. Referring to chili as a bowl of blessedness in his diaries. Will Rogers always advised that one should, quote, always drink upstream from the herd. <laughs> I'm glad you figured that out. Rogers, a public supporter of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, helped to bring assistance to the masses of poor Americans and American Indians following the Depression. The older stone homes from that era, affectionately known as FDR houses, still dot many reservations today and are still standing. Um, so Cello, he says, uh, using a little American Indian humor, cello chili is served up with a heaping helping of fun and sincere admiration. So, you guys are being so polite, um, you know, and so quiet. But if you have to laugh at any point, like, feel free if you, if you want. You really, like, you don't have to be too polite. <laughs> All right. Cello chili. Ooh, ooh, one carved 
grated or two cups powdered frogs. Four pigs grated or two cups powdered frogs.
this next song, I'll take a few questions. Because there must be questions. This is a little strange, right? It's a little different. <laughs> so think of questions for the next, uh, after this song. So this song is called Decolonization. It's a piece that I wrote um, a while back. After I heard <clears throat> one of my elders, Tom Porter, gave this talk that he called decolonization. And it was so interesting because he talked about solutions to decolonization rather than all the horrible things that happened to the Indians, which a lot of horrible things happened, but there's a lot of great things too. And so he talked about how, to, um, how we can reacculturate and sort of get past the decolonization. So, and he has helped with this a lot with language programs and culture programs and bringing back ceremonies and some really beautiful things that this, this man and a lot of the um, Haudenosaunee people, so the Mohawk people are part of a confederacy of five nations and that is called the Iroquois Confederacy. By most people, we prefer to call it Haudenosaunee. So Iroquois is sort of an insulting anglicized French Franco name. Um, so we like to use Haudenosaunee. And the Mohawk people um, had at one point, <clears throat> when I first started studying the language, no, it was a few years before that, they said that there were only six people left who could speak fluently and that it was considered an extinct language at that point. And now we have over 6,000 who speak fluently. It's pretty amazing. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, so I'll teach you a word. I should teach you a word. Which word should I teach you? Um, Sago. So that's how you say hello. Sago. Let's try it. Sago. So just say Sago next to you to somebody. <laughs> so Sago sort of, if you look at it from a very um, literal, like you divide the syllables down, it would mean the seed of my breath goes towards you or goes into the world. Isn't that beautiful? It's not like just, hey, how you doing? Although we use it like, hey, how you doing? But it has a much deeper meaning than that. I think it's really pretty. Um, at most of my concerts, I do a lot of more electronic, um, you know, with tracks and guitar and drums and stuff. And then I, I do sing a lot more in my language. So in this piece, I am singing a few words in my language and a few words in um, uh, Amazonian language. Uh, and basically, when, when Tom Porter um, gave this talk about decolonization, he, he's a kind of speaker who will be really serious and tell you this historical part. And then he gets off of that really quickly and he'll tell you a ridiculous joke, like totally like childish, like seven-year-old joke, you know, and of course we're all laughing. And then the next second you're crying because he's telling us this poignant story. And then he'll start talking, telling us a story in Mohawk and it feels as if we understand him completely and we only understand a few words, right? So this is, the con this is a storytelling way that, that a lot of Native people I think have actually. We know how to get our audiences a lot of times with our stories. And, he is a masterful storyteller and an incredible elder, like cultural specialist elder. But so what I did after this talk, I started writing this song. And what I did is I took different um, songs from the sort of American United States, well, really the Americas, short songs. So there's like uh, influence of the blues. There's a human healing song. There's an influence of uh, Christian chant. There's like different things that we experience being on this land, right? Which, um, and, then I, and then I sort of interweave them so it feels like you're telling a story, like I'm going from one thing to the next, if that makes sense. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Oh, come on in. Anybody want a seat before I start again? Raise your hand if you have a... <laughs> Nobody wants to go into those seats because I don't want to hop over people. <laughs> All right.
nu el garune Tan alun pe gatni kun liho Arasi guarasi abahi like the Hendrix part. Notice unplugged. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, any questions? Anybody got a question? Um, Not a one. Nobody? Yeah. When I hit it on the wood, you know, this is from the 1700s, this bow. A fatigue. It's a really nice bow. I probably shouldn't do that, but I have for so long now. And if a cellist who knew what I was doing, they, they would give me a talking to, yeah. 
I've been wanting to buy a really good fiberglass bow because now they have great ones, right? I just, I, it's like my arm, this bow, like I, it's hard for me to play with another bow, but I probably should. And I will take that under advisement now that you asked. <laughs> I know. No, no, I know. I know. I love it too. I love doing this. Because it sounds like wood or I don't know. It's just... Also, because I know this bow so well, I can control the exact rhythm I want. Like a lot of people can't actually control the rhythm. But I think it's just because I've, I've been with this bow for so long. <laughs> I pulled it out of tune, so. Another question? Yes. Say what? Oh yeah, I was singing in Mohawk. I sang um, Creator Be With Us, uh, Let Us Live Our Lives With a Good Mind, I Love You, My Brothers and Sisters. And then in the Amazonian language, I said um, sisters, brothers, and all people because I don't know that language so well, so those are the only, I only got the few words that I could say, so. Yes? I mean, I do obviously believe that vibration is powerful, right? So like my whole life is sort of about vibration, whether it's how I approach someone or how I play music or how I speak, right? I'm not saying my, I'm always the perfect speaker, you know, sometimes I get mad and say things I should, but for the most part. So, um, but I do think when there's an ancient language, there is something about it that even, like even students of mine, I encourage them to even just say three words in Mohawk. I just learned three words because you're invoking an old vibration that is part of this land that we're on, right? Or the pe or know the land that you're on, right? Like the Piscataway are from near here, the Lenape are from near, like we have the Delaware. There's several tribes that this is their original land, right? And so I'm grateful to be on their land because it feels like mine now too. But um, there is something about the vibration of the land that is connected to the language, I think, I believe, yeah. So that's nice. Anybody else? I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. So is it, is it physically grueling to play? I've noticed you're holding your hands. Are your fingers... Um... No, I got rosin on them, and they're really sticky, and I forgot to leave a wet, wet wipe out on the stage. <laughs> so I'm like sticky, so I'm trying to get the rosin off for the next song, because the next song's really hard. <laughs> but um, no, 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 it's not cramping, it's just I got... It, they got sticky because there's see there's rosin like up here and I touched it while I was playing but um I have to say this music is hard but it's but I've played it for a while like I know like I was ready for tonight and I still got so nervous because I feel such a responsibility to these composers because I'm doing their music you know I just I, I want to do it well so I do get more nervous for this kind of performance than doing my own music because if I mess it up you know I'll make up something else or I don't know so, yeah. No, I, yeah, so I'm looking a little funny up here, huh? Am I going, am I doing weird things? Ooh! Yeah. Oh, you're awesome! <laughs> she's from, she's an all-female karate person, too. Oh, that's neat. Talk to her afterwards if you're interested in karate. All right, I really appreciate that. One more question while I'm wiping my hand. Anybody have another question? Hi, Susan, I just saw you there. I haven't, seen you in a, I haven't seen some of these people in a long time. It's really lovely. So the basket here, I was trying to look a little neater with all my sheets of music. This basket is actually the, uh, one of the last carved baskets by the Sickles family, who are from uh, Aquasasne, the Mohawk Reserve that's on the border of um, New York and uh, Canada. And uh, they, they're really well known in Akwesasne in particular for their basket makers. Um, one of them won a National Heritage Award two years ago. Um, and, and he went to it, he was 98, and he went with all his baskets, it was very sweet. So um, that tradition is definitely coming back now as a result of um, the ash trees were becoming extinct. 
So young people got together to try to get seedlings and started a campaign across all the Mohawk reserves to start building the black ash so that we didn't have to be careful of how many we took down. So they're, they're definitely keeping the cycle going. So I'm looking for my next song. Here it is. This next one is by Raven Chacon. Raven Chacon is um, the most avant-garde of the composers, although he did write some of the music out. Some of it has strange symbols that I have to interpret. And, um, it's called Tagi Detsa, which means in Navajo, uh, he's Navajo Diné, it means three points. And so he wrote this in three sections. And the first section, he has symbols from Navajo culture, which I wasn't supposed to know what they're about when he first wrote it, then later he told me what they were about, and so now I sort of know what they're about. And then I interpret those with improvisation, and then the other parts are written out notes. Then the middle movement is completely by oral transmission. So he actually recorded a CD on electric guitar and sort of distorted voice, and then I improvise according to what I heard. And then the last section is fully not notated. And I do sing in Navajo, um, but I'm not to know what it means so I can't tell you what, what it means. He um, is part of a very um, a big arts activist group called Post Commodity that does major sound installations all over the world. They just did a huge one in Rome and a big one in Berlin uh, last year, and then one right along the border, you know, the Mexican border. They did a big installation with balloons. It's, I think that one's still there with sound attached, like amplifiers attached. Um, little pickups attached to all the balloons. It's, they're doing it, they do very interesting stuff, post-commodity, you can check that out if you want. So, Taki Ditsa. So, movement one is called Like a Chased Animal. Movement two is called Shy for a Singer Looking for Her Grandfather Being Scared. And movement three is called Quiet but Proud, Like Singing at Night. <coughs>
This one is quiet but proud, like singing at night, and it imitates a kind of distorted uh, powwow drum sound and uses a lot of microtones, for those of you who know what that might be.
have one song left, sort of Beethoven-ish, like passionate. He loves having, um, this is by Teo Basenti, another Navajo artist. And um, he really likes a lot of uh, dissonance mixed with consonants. And then I'll just play a little song at the very end that is not native classical, but more of the native kind of chilly thing I do. Um, looks like a class is going, so uh, let me wait for them. <laughs> So when I first met this composer, he was very shy. Six foot four, humongous, very shy guy. You wouldn't expect it looking at him, but... So we would only rehearse on Skype. And he could only get to Skype where there was Wi-Fi um, on certain days of the week, because he was really like in a remote part right outside the Navajo Reservation. Now he actually lives in... Um, Many years later now, he moved to New Mexico and he's been, he's helped start a group, a uh, contemporary, like a new music um, chamber group. So he's gotten a little less shy. But it's fascinating to work with these composers because of the way that different people explain how to play their music or the soundscapes of their own culture and life. Like we all have sounds that are like sort of our sounds, whether we realize it or not. Like we all have words we all say like a lot, <laughs> certain parts of our life, right? But there are different soundscapes that go to our own personalities, but there are also different soundscapes that go to different, cult that go with different cultures. Like that last piece, when I was playing the ending, he said, well, in classical music, you'd say, could you diminuendo or could you decrescendo? And that would mean get softer, right? But what he said is, can you just be sort of like a breeze when it's just going away? Like that, that was how he explained it, right? Because he just thinks of it differently. So a lot of the um, kinds of ways of saying things and explaining things are, were fascinating. So one thing in the Navajo tradition is the, the traditional ceremonial music is very strict and very formulaic, probably more than many of the traditions. So at, usually at the end of every section of a ceremonial song, you have a group of four chants. So he does not do four chants, but he'll have me play a note for like 16 beats. You know, so it could be like four times, but connect them. Or, so a lot of times he'll sort of, inside the music are these hidden Navajo, um, kind of expressions and beliefs. Although, if you talk to him, he said, oh no, but I wasn't thinking that. I just did that, because of course he just did that. It's part of his life, right? But then when we talk more, sometimes things, things would come out. Um, and the thing about a Navajo cadence, that kind of four, is that it's very grounding. So that uh, there are parts where you feel ungrounded and where it's the dissonance he considers the cake, like the, um, the beauty. Like when things are grinding against each other, he considers that sensual and beautiful. He's like, that's the sensual part. And then when you just play like, just plain, in his opinion, that's the cake. So you're going to hear a lot of cake and a lot of sensual. But I have to tune one more time before I do a lot. I do hear a phone going off. That would be nice if whoever's phone just went off, just turn it off, just, just through this piece, and then, then phones can go on and do whatever you want. Take pictures, take videos, take selfies. OK. So this is called Sonata for Solo Cello Number 1, and I believe it's in six movements, but like one movement is 30 seconds. So it, they're all sort of short. Thank you. 
going to play something that is more, um, so this piece is actually devoted to the circle dancing traditions like of the whirling dervish, the Sufi, and then also um, circle dances of like the hoop dance, eagle dance. There's from many traditions, there are different kinds of circle dances. In March, I'm releasing a new project that's um, based on a lot of sacred principles, so, uh, and it'll have a lot of dancers, uh, some dervishes, and a uh, hoop dancer might be coming for part of it. So that's happening here in March. I would love if you guys came. With Larry Mitchell, who some of you know, um, he's been here a bunch, has a, a great guitarist, electric guitarist, and uh, does ambient sounds too, and a great percussionist, Bafar Bahadurang, will be with us. That's in March, and there'll be a big party, I hear. The school's gonna have a big party that day for everybody. So, March 20th, be here. <laughs> so this piece is called Circling. 
has a lot of different levels to it. You can decide which one you want to take. Circling for your love, whatever that means to you. And thank you very much. I'll be out, out in the lobby after if you want to ask questions or say hi. Jump out or run away. Longing many lifetimes for you. Yes, I've been longing many lifetimes for you. Sorry. For me and me for you. Call off the sash. Already found. Waited this lifetime for you. Circling, circling, circling all around me. I know. Thank you.